Our last speaker of this session is Abigail Bookwalter. Um, can you hear us, Abigail? Yes, hello. Can you Great. hear me? Great. Yeah. Thanks for joining today, and you can just start when you're ready. Great. Thank you. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Okay, perfect. Uh, all right, well, hello everybody. Uh, good morning from California. Um, I'm really happy to be joining you uh, today for my first time attending ARDB. Unfortunately, it has to be virtual, but hopefully I can join you in person in the future. Um, so today I'm gonna share with you some ongoing and unpublished work we've been doing in an effort to quantify protein and cell lifetimes in vivo in mammalian tissues to help us to understand uh, the homeostasis of tissue organization and how that's affected by the aging process. And you'll notice in my title, I say pathological aging um, in, paren in parentheses here, because we're focusing first on hutchinson guilford progeria syndrome, but we have uh, intentions of applying these studies to uh, physiological aging in the future. So I'm a card carrying cell biologist, and it's through this lens that I think about the process of aging. Um, and I often think about this in terms of how cells are normally maintained over time in adult tissues and how that maintenance is broken down by the aging process. So we know from a large body of pre-existing work that the protein homeostasis machinery, and um, in particular, the protein folding networks and protein degradation pathways become less robust with age. However, we understand less about what components of the cellular proteome are most affected by these changes in proteostasis. And I want to understand um, what those vulnerable segments of the proteome are and if they are consistent or variable from cell type to cell type. Um, and to start to understand this question, we really need to be able to profile the, uh, the range of protein lifetimes in healthy cell types. Um, and I think this is important because um, Proteins at either extreme, extremely long-lived or extremely short-lived, will be uniquely vulnerable to shifts in the proteostasis machinery. So at the long-lived extreme, for example, uh, a long-lived protein may be never or very rarely replaced, such that it has to function over a very long time scale and might become vulnerable to damage with age from perhaps uh, oxidative modifications or misfolding and gradually lose function without the ability to be replaced. On the other extreme, extremely short-lived proteins are degraded and replaced many, many times over the lifetime of an organism. And this short lifetime um, could be a feature of this protein's function, for instance, in a dynamic signaling network, but also might make a short-lived protein vulnerable to shifts in homeostasis as just a little bit of an imbalance in synthesis in folding or degradation could lead to dysfunction of these proteins. So um, I wanna highlight one, I think really impactful example of a protein at the extreme, um, the extremely long lived nuclear pore complex and the age linked declines in this complex. And this is something that my former postdoctoral mentor, Martin Hetzer elucidated in some really cool work over a decade ago. So what he and colleagues found was that the nuclear pore, um, which mediates all transit between the nucleus and the cytosol, um, is synthesized only in young animals in the worm. So here on this top left, they tracked the activity of a promoter that encodes a nuclear pore protein and saw that it's only active in the embryo, but it's completely shut off in the adult, indicating that this protein is never synthesized in an adult animal. However, of course, these proteins are still detectable both in the embryo and the adult, indicating that they're very long lived and are basically never replaced over this organism's lifetime. What Martin and colleagues found was that this long lifetime of the nuclear pore complex is conserved in mammals as well. And when they tested nuclear pore function by isolating nuclei from young or old rat brains, they found that the nuclei in old brains were more leaky, suggesting that the nuclear pore had lost some of this barrier function with age, perhaps because of misfolding and damage to these long-lived proteins. So this is one really striking example of how an extremely long-lived protein might accumulate damage over time. Um, but what I'm motivated to do is to get a more systematic understanding of these extremes of protein stability in mammalian tissues. And the approach that I'll tell you about today is a metabolic labeling and proteomic quantification approach um, to, to define protein lifetimes. <clears throat> 
Now, of course, there's another parameter here, especially if we're thinking about cell maintenance in the context of intact tissues. These cells themselves have a variety of lifetimes, some um, persisting for decades, if not our whole lifespan, and others persisting only for a few days, such as an epithelial cell. And these different cell types with their different lifetimes also have their own unique vulnerabilities, where a long-lived cell type um, is essentially never replaced and vulnerable to damage with age. On the other hand, a short-lived cell type may be replaced many times over life, but may be vulnerable to loss of the progenitor pools that supply that replacement and maybe senescence of these proliferative cells over time. Um, so the rate of cell turnover is itself a useful parameter for understanding aging through the lens of tissue homeostasis, and it also influences the rates of protein turnover. So we thought it was necessary to profile this parameter as well. And as I'll tell you, we've made some progress in also using metabolic labeling to quantify this metric of cell lifetimes in vivo in, mamal in mammalian tissues. So the approach that we're taking, which is ongoing, is a stable isotope labeling in mammals or SILAM approach, where we feed uh, young adult mice with a chow that is completely isotopically enriched in the stable heavy isotope of nitrogen. And what happens over time is that this heavy isotope is incorporated into all nitrogen containing biomolecules in the animal. We then collect tissues and analyze the proteins and the nucleic acids in these tissues by mass spec. Um, and to date, we have isolated as many tissues as we could possibly figure out how to um, store away from this time course, um, 16 in total. But we have worked through analysis of just the top five that I'm highlighting in bold here, which I'll talk about today. Um, and these are the heart, the vasculature represented by the aorta, the liver, intestine, and the white adipose tissue. Um, and we've performed this uh, time course so far in young adult healthy animals and in hutchinson guilford progeria syndrome animals. And I should note that this um, undertaking was only possible because of support from the Progeria Research Foundation and also because of um, a really excellent and expert collaborator, Sina Gamagami at the University of Rochester, who's an expert in the field of dynamic proteomics. So one of Sina's innovations here was a hyperplexing approach for these experiments that dramatically increases our throughput, decreases cost, and allows us to determine both protein degradation and abundance measurements from the same experiment. Um, so some of you may be familiar with tandem mass tagging. We are now able to do this up to 16 plex where we multiplex 16 samples in one experiment and we can get both protein turnover and abundance measurements. So here we're tracking protein degradation um, based on the rate of loss of unlabeled protein over time. And then in parallel, we can track protein abundance by comparing the unlabeled samples from a progeroid animal to a wild type animal. I won't actually touch on any of the abundance data today, although it has given us some really interesting insights into tissue specific phenomena in progeria, but I'm gonna focus on the protein turnover data. Okay, so let's jump into the data that we've acquired so far. So we've um, analyzed uh, protein stability across four tissues. I'm showing here the intestine, liver, fat, and heart, and also the numbers of the proteins that we were able to quantify half-lives for are indicated here. And what you can see, I'm um, showing degradation rate on the left and then half-life that's predicted from that degradation rate on the right is that proteins have dramatically different lifetimes in these different tissues with proteins in the intestine and liver turning over about twice as fast as proteins in the adipose tissue and heart. Now you might think that this difference in stability is because we're profiling distinct proteins that have tissue specific expression in these different tissues. But this difference persists when we restrict our analysis just to the about 900 proteins that we could detect and quantify in all four of these tissues. Even still, uh, we see that proteins in the intestine and liver turn over about as, uh, twice as fast as proteins in the fat and the heart. Uh, if we zoom in a little bit more and look at one particular pairwise comparison, you can see how dramatic this difference is. So I'm showing you here the predicted half-life for proteins detected in the heart versus the predicted half-life for those same proteins detected in the liver. You can see that there are a cluster of proteins that have very similar half-lives in both tissues, but this large skew of proteins that are dramatically more long-lived in the heart. So we wanna understand how this difference in protein stability is controlled. Um, and an immediate one that comes to mind and has been uh, suggested in the dynamic proteomic field for a while is that differences in cell turnover rate underlie this distinct protein stability across tissues. This has been proposed by other groups, but has never been tested and quantified in parallel along with pro proteome turnover measurements, uh, which is what we set out to do. 
So we reasoned that this would be possible from the same metabolic labeling experiment because all nitrogen containing biomolecules are being labeled over time in these animals, including genomic DNA. So we simply isolated genomic DNA from these tissues, digested that complex mixture of uh, sequence down to its constituent nucleosides, and then quantified the ratio of heavy to light nitrogen in these free nucleosides by mass spec. Um, I won't get into the details today, but we did do some very important control experiments to verify that we are actually tracking de novo incorporation into genomic DNA, which is linked to DNA replication rates and importantly linked to the rate of cell proliferation. So when we do these experiments across tissues, what we see, um, perhaps not surprisingly, is that proteins in the heart tissue, or sorry, cells in the heart tissue, uh, turn over quite slowly with a doubling time over 100 days. The uh, white adipose tissue also turns over quite slowly, which has been previously reported by other methods. Um, and we were a little surprised to see that the liver turns over rather slowly. Um, and the liver has been uh, studied quite extensively as a regenerative and proliferative tissue. But I think it's important to note that that regeneration occurs in response to damage or disease. Uh, whereas our data would suggest under homeostatic conditions that the liver actually renews quite slowly. And at the other extreme, um, as we might expect, the intestinal epithelia turns over quite quickly, and we know that this renews quite rapidly. So that's consistent with our expect expectations. So this is itself a useful metric for understanding tissue homeostasis and understanding how that homeostasis shifts in aging. And we're applying this met metric more broadly across the labeled tissues we've collected but it also makes it possible for us to determine the true protein degradation rates that we've detected in our proteomic experiments as the actual protein degradation rate is influenced both by um, the proteolytic processes of degrading a protein and the dilution of proteins by cell division. So we could take these cell turnover rates and correct our detected protein turnover rates and then ask the question of whether now proteins have consistent stability across tissues. And as you can see, the answer to that is clearly no. Um, the proteins that are uh, detected across these four tissues are still dramatically more slowly turned over in the fat and the heart than in the liver and the intestine, indicating that cell proliferation alone does not account for the variation in proteome stability across tissues that we observe. Uh, so if we, you know, again, come back to this open question of how protein stability is controlled, cell turnover certainly contributes, but there must be other factors that also contribute and are differently active across different tissues. So for instance, perhaps the proteostasis machinery is differently active, or there may be more local effects such as changes in protein folding, post-translational modifications, or interactions. Um, so with this data set in hand, we wanted to understand a little bit more about the extremes in protein stability in each of these tissues. Um, so what I'm showing here are some gene ontologies that we've collected from um, proteins that are in the least stable decile or the most stable decile in each tissue. And what I hope you can see is that there are some components that are clearly and consistently very stable across all tissues. And the nucleosome would be an example of that around which DNA is wrapped but there are others that are more variable from tissue to tissue, such as the mitochondria, which are surprisingly extremely long-lived in the heart and also the adipose tissue, but not other tissues we've profiled. So this would suggest that there are tissue-specific uh, vulnerabilities um, in the proteome across different tissues. Um, so we wanted to integrate this information into a more global metric. So we came up uh, with a dispersion metric uh, to quantify the spread in degradation rates that we detect across tissues. And I'll show you a couple different analyses of this dispersion metric. But one interesting thing we noticed across our data set is that some organelles, such as peroxisomes and mitochondria, have very variable turnover rates across tissues, while others are much more consistent. And the nucleus would be at the other extreme here, where it has a very consistent turnover rate across tissues. Uh, we can also analyze this data based on enzymatic pathways, and we can see that some enzymatic pathways that are extremely variable in their stability across tissues include oxidative phosphorylation and fat metabolism, while at the other extreme, um, RNA metabolism and RNA splicing appear to be very consistently regulated across tissues. So to summarize what I've shown you so far, uh, using the new proteomic methods we've developed, we can define protein abundance, although I haven't shown you that data, protein lifetime and cell lifetime in vivo. 
And these uh, experiments have revealed that protein lifetime varies across tissues, but importantly, this variance is at least in part independent of cell proliferation rate. We don't understand what the other factors are that control protein stability across tissues, but we're very interested in answering that question. And our data suggest shared and unique aging vulnerabilities across tissues. So for instance, the mitochondria are extremely stable in the heart, but not in other tissues, while the nucleus is consistently, many elements of it, quite stable across many tissues. So in the last few moments here, I wanna talk about how aging influences protein homeostasis across tissues. And again, the caveat here, we are looking first at Hutchinson-Guilford progeria syndrome, which is a pathological accelerated aging syndrome. So we applied the same analyses to uh, young adult progeroid mice um, and quantified their protein turnover rates. And we found quite strikingly that across tissues, um, the proteome seems to have a globally decreased degradation rate, suggesting a global change in protein degradation capacity. Um, and this was apparent across uh, liver, aorta, heart, and fat, although not apparent in the intestine, interestingly. And if we um, correct these degradation rates for cell turnover, as I just described a moment ago, we see that this difference in degradation persists, indicating that the intrinsic degradation rates of the proteome are decreased in progeria. Um, this was consistent with some previous indications that the proteasome declines in activity in progeria, and also intuitively is uh, consistent with what we know about physiological aging with the decrease in the robustness of the proteostasis network. So finally, this data suggested to us something about the etiology and the possible treatment of progeria. So um, Thomas Deli's group and others have been working on gene therapies for this disease. Um, and what they've found is that it's possible to effectively clear the transcript um, that encodes the toxic progerin protein um, from uh, various tissues in an animal. Um, but it seems that they are less effective at clearing the toxic protein, which is what these Western blots below here show. So even after almost six months of treatment, they see that um, they can clear the toxic protein from the liver, but very poorly from the heart. Now we thought this suggested maybe variable protein stability across these tissues. And we were able to analyze that in our proteomic data. And we found quite clearly that the lamin proteins are much more slowly degraded in tissues that have pathology in progeria, including the heart, the fat, and the major vasculature, and must much more rapidly turned over in the liver and the intestine, which intriguingly are spared from pathology in this disease. And this distinction becomes even more stark when you correct for cell turnover rates. So to conclude, we think that this, uh, this observation has important implications for gene therapies in progeria and possibly gene therapies for other diseases, because the implicit assumption here is that if you target the transcript or the gene that encodes a toxic protein, that the protein will disappear. But in the case of the lamins, which are long lived in some tissues, this assumption does not hold. Okay, so to summarize what I've shown you in the second part of this talk, we find a global decline in protein degradation rates across progeroid tissues. And we find that the progeria linked lamin A protein has variable stability across tissues and is extremely long lived in tissues that exhibit progeroid pathology. We think this long lifetime is a roadblock for gene therapy approaches and suggests that we need other types of approaches, perhaps to directly attack the, this toxic protein. So with that, I will conclude my talk um, and thank you all for your attention, as well as the members of my lab, in particular, John Hasper, uh, who did the majority of this work, uh, the Mistelli Lab for generously sharing unpublished reagents and data, and our really excellent collaborators at the University of Rochester. Thank you all. Uh, thank you very much. We have a question here in the audience. So um, very... Very nice talk indeed, very nice work. Just going back to the original sort of set of observations, you're detecting 900 or 700 proteins in, in, your, in your experiments. Do the 900 that you can detect uh, have a nice distribution in, in, in relation to their, their predicted size versus their whole predicted proteome and their amino acid composition? I guess I'm asking about whether proteins with more charge residues are more likely to be turned over faster or they're not represented in your set because you can't detect them. Ah. Yes. Um, so certainly I can say in terms of um, 
abundance, the proteins that we detect and are able to quantify half-lives for, meaning that they show up uh, reproducibly in each time point of the experiment, are more abundant. Um, but we don't see any trends in terms of protein size or protein charge uh, in terms of the proteins we're able to detect. Um, I should say that we are quality filtering um, these uh, decay curves to determine fits. And at either extreme, uh, that quality filtering will triage a protein. So it's very possible that we have excluded some proteins that are extremely short-lived or extremely long-lived. And in part for that reason, we are actually in the process of starting a much longer time course. Um, so in the future, we'll be able to detect more rare protein turnover and cell turnover events. And uh, we have time for one more question from Slack, from Jose. Do the proteins with different stability across tissues depend primarily on proteasomal degradation or autophagy? Yeah, that's a great question that we're really interested in. Um, we don't have a conclusive answer to that yet. Um, and yeah, I mean, I could speculate, but I really don't know. Um, and I would love to find an answer to that question. So uh, in terms of, you know, just kind of sifting through the data and looking for trends of, you know, what's been annotated as a clear autophagy substrate versus a proteosomal substrate, there are no obvious distinctions there. Um, but I would love to do an experiment uh, where the activity of the autophagy or proteosomal pathway has been manipulated and then do some of these same turnover measurements to really get at that question. It's a great question. Okay, thanks. And there are several more questions on Slack, so it would be great if you can go online to reply to them. And um, thanks again for joining us today. Thank you.